Well, thank you so much, McKenna. And hello, everyone. Um, it's really awesome to be here through Zoom to be able to talk to you guys and share a little bit about my life working as a psychiatric NP. Before I begin, can you all hear and see me okay? Can you guys just give me like a thumbs up to make sure you guys can hear and see me okay? All right, perfect. Well, it sounds like most of you guys are, are able to do that. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started. So I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of an introduction of myself. So um, my name is Dr. Jonathan Yamis. I'm a board certified psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. And um, today I'm just going to be talking to you guys um, what a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner does, as well as the journey and the path as, as to how I actually got there. Okay, so I'll go ahead and start. So before I kind of talk about what a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner does, I do want to give kind of a brief history about nursing. If those of you are unaware of what the nursing profession got started. Um, so in regards to how nursing actually became as a profession, it actually, um, the very first documents actually started around 300 AD, if you believe it or not, during the Roman Empire. And um, even though nursing um, for the most part of history has been considered a female dominated profession, um, men were actually considered to be history's first nurses as they actually tended to many of the injured and the dying during the crusades of Europe, as well as uh, when the black plague swept through Alexandria. Um, now the modern era of nursing actually began around 1854 and most of you guys may or may not have heard of Florence Nightingale. She's pretty much the poster child of, of nursing and she and as well as a group of extraordinary female nurses um, actually provided care during the Crimean War. And that was what kind of pushed nursing to the forefront in the 1860s. And then um, around that time as well, that's when she very, uh, that's when she opened the very first nursing school in London. So now the nursing profession has actually exploded. Um, nursing now has, has been seen now as, as not just a female dominated profession, but also a welcome profession for males who are interested in, in joining the field. And, um, you know, in addition to psychiatric mental health nursing, um, we offer other very specializations, such as pediatrics, oncology, uh, family medicine, midwifery, and obviously psychiatry. And um, the nursing profession continues to rank number one as the most ethical and honest profession for 18 years in a row, um, according to the most recent Gallup poll. So um, what is psychiatric mental health nursing, you may ask. So um, psychiatric mental health nursing is actually a nursing specialty that primarily focuses on providing care for people suffering from mental illnesses. So this can pretty much vary in range from people suffering from schizophrenia, um, schizoaffective disorder, mood disorders, anxiety, personality disorders, eating disorders, suicidal thoughts, psychosis, paranoia, and self-harm. Um, so for the most of early history, um, a lot of the times, competent and empathetic psychiatric care actually did not exist, unfortunately. So oftentimes people who were considered or deemed mentally ill, um, they were often incarcerated, they were tortured, um, or they were you know, locked up in cages. So um, the formal recognition of psychiatry actually didn't change or it, it wasn't legitimized until around 1808. And that was when Dr. William Ellis actually proposed um, keepers of the insane. That's what they actually called the people who were actually caring for the mentally ill at the time. Um, he actually proposed to give them better pay and better training so that he would hopefully attract more people who were respectable and intelligent um, to the profession. And psychiatric nursing um, wasn't officially formalized as a specialty in the U.S. until about 1882. And that's when Linda Richards, who was um, considered to be the first professionally trained American nurse, um, she opened Boston City College. And that was actually the first school um, that was designed to train nurses in psychiatric care. So let me go ahead and there. So you guys may ask, like, what's the pathway to actually become a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. So in nursing, it's kind of interesting um, because there's various pathways that one can go about this, but I'm just gonna go ahead and delineate the five pretty straightforward steps to become a psych NP, all right? So the first step um, that you would need to do if you are interested in becoming a psych nurse practitioner, is that you would first have to get your bachelor's of science in nursing. So um, there's a lot of different programs out there nowadays. Um, there's a traditional programs, which is your four-year undergraduate degrees. And um, there are other programs that are more accelerated. So you can get your bachelor's of science in nursing in about three years time. Um, but the most important thing that you guys have to remember is that if you are pursuing or looking into nursing school, make sure that the program is accredited um, because that's going to make it easier for you if you do decide to pursue graduate level education because if you attend a non-accredited university um, a lot of the times the units or the classes may not transfer over and it might be hard harder for you to to get into you know a master's program or a doctor of nursing practice program 
So <clears throat> after you've completed your bachelor's of science in nursing, then you would have to pass the National Council Licensure Examination or the NCLEX RN. So that's pretty much the licensure examination that all um, undergraduate nurses would have to go through. Um, it's a smart exam. So the amount of questions can range to about 75 to 145 questions. Um, obviously right now, since we're all in a pandemic, um, I, I know they've made some variations and changes um, in regards to how the program um, and how the test is actually administered, um, but it's still the same. You would still have to pass this exam in order for you to get um, your fully licensure um, RN license. So after you have your RN license, the next step is to obviously gain some experience as a psychiatric um, registered nurse. So a lot of times people ask me, a lot of students ask me, you know, I, I graduated with my BSN, but I want to do, uh, I want to become a psych uh, nurse practitioner. Um, do I have to have psych, do I have to have psychiatric, you know, bedside nursing experience to, before I do that? And I always, always stress the importance of making sure that you have some sort of at least experience in the bedside, especially if you do want to work in psychiatry, um, just because of the fact that um, it's important for you to feel comfortable as well as familiar um, with the, the setting. Because oftentimes people might just say like, oh, psych nursing sounds interesting. I like talking to people. I want to help people. But then um, when they actually start um, working with that specific type of population, they realize it's maybe not what they envision it to be. Um, and especially you becoming a provider as a nurse practitioner, it's very, very important that you already have somewhat of a foundational understanding of what it is like to work as a nurse in psychiatry before making that next step. So I always, always stress to uh, gain at least one year of experience first. So you have a taste of, of what psych nursing is, as well as getting a familiarity with working with various providers, such as psychiatrists, you know, social workers, therapists, um, and other ancillary staff. So once you've gained your experience as a psych RN, then it's your time to kind of look into graduate level programs. So again, there's different ways to go about this. The two most common ways is either you can pursue your master's of science in nursing um, or your doctor of nursing practice. So your master of science in nursing, again, it can vary depending on the type of program. Um, there's some programs where it's hybrid. So it's a mix of online as well as on campus. Some master's program are all online and some are just a traditional where you would have to go on campus. So if you decide to get your master's, it can range for an additional two to three years of graduate level education. Education. Um, but if you do decide to pursue getting your, your doctorate degree or, or your doctor of nursing practice, that can range about four years of, of time um, if you do decide to pursue that route. Okay, and then like I said, in regards to bachelor's um, programs, it's very important also to, to get a, into a program that's accredited because that's, that's very important um, just to make sure that you are getting the knowledge necessary in order for you to become competent um, providers. And then after you've gone ahead and completed either your master's of science or your doctor of nursing practice, then you would have to go ahead and pass a certification examination. So this is a little bit different, different than a licensure exam because actually as a provider, um, as a nurse practitioner, you're, you're not actually going to be taking another licensure to become a nurse practitioner, um, but you do have to take a certification exam just to make sure that you can kind of validate and show that you are competent to work um, as a provider. Okay. So the next thing is career, career trajectory as well as the average salary of a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. Because again, this is some of the most common questions that I get from students or prospective students asking me, um, you know, what's the pay like, what's the salary like? And again, it all differs and depends on your practice or where you're working. So um, the graphs that I put here, it's, it's, it's a bit cursory. And um, I know it's, it's a bit like, uh, a little bit outdated since because this was 2015, but I just wanted to put this out here so then you have somewhat of an idea in terms of how pay is like. So as you can see, the top paying states, obviously California, Alaska, Hawaii, Massachusetts, and Oregon. And I believe New York also pays pretty well as well. And um, again, in regards to how they pay, it, it all depends, number one, on your level of education. Um, if you have your master's or your doctorate, um, it can also vary depending on how many years of experience you have. Um, and it can also depend, again, where you work. If you work in a hospital setting, it may differ because they might pay you either hourly or salary, um, as opposed to you if you decide to work in a private practice setting where I currently work, um, it's a little bit different as well in terms of the pay structure. So just be mindful of that. And then in regards to the wide range of settings, I've just kind of put it there for you guys. Um, you know, they, you know, psychiatric nurse practitioners, we can work in a variety of settings. Um, you know, for the most part, we all can work 
Uh, most of my colleagues and I, we work either in the outpatient setting or the private practice setting, but I do have colleagues as well who work in the inpatient mental health settings as well as the hospital settings. So what are the roles and responsibilities of a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner? So um, as a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, pretty much the role that we do is to essentially assess, diagnose, um, educate, and treat mental health needs of patients. So for us, we, we act as providers. Um, we, we pretty much do everything like a psychiatrist would do. Um, and it, you know, it, the only thing that differs um, from our psychiatrist counterparts, it's just kind of how we were trained, right? Because for nurses, we're trained in the nursing model, which kind of encompasses more of a holistic approach um, as opposed to the medical model. Um, and, mo and many psych NPs, um, in addition to medication management, which is what we mostly do, which is obviously prescribe medications and kind of make adjustments or titrations in regards to their treatment plan, um, some psych NPs as well can also incorporate some form of psychotherapy. So that can include cognitive behavioral therapy, as well as dialectal behavioral therapy, as well as EMDR, which stands for eye movement sensitivity sensation and reprocessing, which can be very helpful for people who suffer from PTSD. So in regards to a typical workday, again, it depends on your practice setting. So if you work in a hospital, it might be eight to 12 hour shifts. I mean, for me, I work in the private practice setting. So I currently work four 10 hour days. So I work Monday through Friday um, from about 7.30 to about 5.30 in the evening. And I'm always off Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I'm off all holidays. So the, uh, the setting and the work days is all very contingent, again, upon where you're working, the company, and what they expect from you. Oh, and in regards to, I guess, patient caseload as well, um, again, it just varies depending on where you're practicing. For me, currently, I currently see between either eight to about you know, 16 or 17 patients a day. So it just can vary. Um, but for the most part, it, it also depends on your comfortability and, and if you're willing to see more patients or if you feel like you want to see a little bit less or if you want to incorporate therapy, um, all of that will come into play. All right, so I just want to talk about a little bit about my nursing journey and how I got to where I am today. So um, when I was considering going into nursing, um, I was uh, very, very young. I was a senior in high school and, and that was about in 2008. Um, I kind of went into nursing um, just because of the fact that um, I was raised in a predominantly Filipino family. So nursing was something that um, was put up there as one of the most respectable professions. And um, at the time I didn't really understood uh, how, I guess, how emotionally um, demanding and uh, mentally challenging the nursing program is. Um, I just kind of assumed that, oh, I love helping people. I, 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 I want to do that for the rest of my life. And so that was something that kind of interested me. But I guess I wasn't really fully prepared about how much sacrifice and how much hard work I had to actually put in in order for me to actually graduate and be successful. So um, at, when I graduated high school, I was only 17 years old. I started um, my undergraduate degree at Mount St. Mary's University. That's where I was planning to get my bachelor's of science in nursing. Um, however, again, I was very, very naive at the time. I didn't really put in the hours to study. And so unfortunately, I ended up getting kicked out of the program um, just because my grades were really, really terrible. Um, I had a 1.8 GPA. I, I failed pretty much all of my science classes. And obviously, the nursing profession, it's very science heavy. And I, I guess at the time, I didn't really understand just how heavy it was, you know? So unfortunately, I had to get kicked out of that program. And um, I had to find a way to kind of kind of make up for lost time, right? So thankfully I was able to um, go to my local community colleges and I was trying my best to um, raise my GPA. Again, it was difficult for me because my GPA was extremely low, it was below a 2.0. Um, and at the time, um, again, even till now, nursing programs are even very, very more competitive. So after I completed all of my prerequisites at my community college, um, I was able to increase my GPA to about maybe 2.2, 2.3, but it still obviously wasn't competitive enough. And um, I still remember till this day, um, my uh, advisor actually told me uh, that, you know, you don't have what it takes to be a nurse. Uh, you don't seem like you're intelligent enough or you don't seem that you have, you know, the, the educational background or, or the resiliency to be able to pull it through. You should just kind of, you know, give up and just find something else because I don't think it's gonna pan out for you. You know, and those words are still something that kind of sticks with me till today, actually. And um, it's something that kind of even drove me to 
to hopefully prove her wrong, but also prove myself that, that I can kind of still accomplish this. So um, I had to really dig down and, and really think introspectively, like, is this the best that I can do? And I knew in my heart that this wasn't the best that I can do. So I ended up, um, you know, really trying my luck and applying to different nursing programs. I got rejected so many, so many times. Um, it wasn't until my alma mater, West Coast University, actually gave me an opportunity to, to try and, and um, you know, if it wasn't for them, I, I don't think I'd be here being able to speak to all of you guys. Um, but thankfully, I was able to turn um, my life around. Um, I, I studied extremely hard. I sacrificed like I've never sacrificed before. I really put in the hours and the dedication to be able to get through where, I, where I'm at. And so after I graduated from West Coast, I actually got I actually graduated with a 3.8 GPA. So believe it or not, from someone with a 1.8 and then you graduate with 3.8, um, you know, it was really like a testament just like how far I was able to come. Um, so with that being said, after that, I, I got a chance to work in a variety of different locations. Um, I started off my nursing career um, in the ER. I, I moved to Florida Hospital because I wanted to get into a new grad residency program just because I wasn't able to get into a new grad residency program here in California. But I was able to learn a lot working in the ER setting. Um, but I just knew um, something inside of me knew that it wasn't sustainable for me long term. So I went back, moved back to California. Um, I got a chance to work at the county. I worked at Harbor UCLA in the ICU setting. Um, but it wasn't until I started working in psychiatry, that's when I started to find my niche. And that was where I kind of realized like, this is where I, I, I feel like I belong. And I got to work with really great psychiatrists as well as other nurses. And they kind of inspired me to maybe consider moving back and going to school. And um, at the time, I didn't even know a psych NP existed, to be honest. Um, a lot of my friends at the time, they wanted to become a family nurse practitioner. But I didn't know there was such a thing called a psych nurse practitioner until I started doing research. And I started to see like, oh, there's such a thing called a psych nurse practitioner. So I looked around and um, I was able to enroll um, to Loma Linda University um, at the time. They just opened their bachelor's of science in nursing to the DMP route. So um, it was for it was a program that allowed students or I mean, uh, nurses who had their bachelor's in nursing and, you know, get their terminal degree in four years. So um, that I felt like that was something that that really um, that really drew me in. And I felt like that was something that made sense to me. Um, I enrolled in 2015. So I was like 24 at the time. And then I graduated in 2019. So I graduated on 28 years old. So I graduated pretty much last year. And, um, you know, it was the pretty much the best decision that I've ever made because I definitely love what I'm doing right now. And it's definitely, um, you know, very rewarding field to be in, especially, especially helping people who are suffering from mental illnesses and stuff like that. So that's a little bit about my, my background. Um, before I close, I do want to briefly touch upon um, the art of empathy and how important that is, especially working in psychiatry. So if you are interested in working in psychiatry, I do believe that's important for me to at least shed some light on, on what that is and, and what to expect. So, so if you guys are not aware of what empathy is, empathy essentially involves the ability to emotionally understand what another person is experiencing. So as a psychiatric nurse practitioner, um, you know, I feel very privileged because, you know, I care for a lot of patients who are you know, emotionally dysregulated, who are depressed, who are anxious, who are, you know, really going through a difficult time. And it's very, very important for you to, to know how to practice empathy um, because patients can definitely feel that from the provider. They know who are the providers who don't care and they know who are the providers who will definitely sit down and listen to them. And, and that's really going to set you apart um, if you do decide to pursue this field. Um, it's also very important to actively listen. So um, for those of you um, interested in this field, psychiatry involves, um, you know, knowing how to listen. So it's not just hearing the patient, um, but what I mean by actively listening is, is also understanding the nonverbal cues, right? Sometimes it's not what we say, but how we say it. So, um, you know, with my time working as a, as a nurse in psychiatry, and when I, when I had six years of bedside experience at Kaiser Mental Health Center, um, it was, I, I, I learned how to pick those up. And then now as a provider, I've learned how to understand the nuances, um, you know, the body, the body languages that a person may exhibit, the micro expressions that they may have. Um, all of those things can come into play. Um, and, and that's what I mean by active listening. So making sure that you pay attention and really be present with the patient because that's, that's very important as a provider. The next thing is offering support. And again, as, an, as a nurse practitioner, it's very, very important to to offer support for your patients. So again, for me, I deal with a lot of 
depressed patients, people who are really going through difficult times, and sometimes they just want a listening ear. Sometimes they just want someone um, to be there for them. And, and it's very, very important for us as providers to, to show that and, and to let them know that we're here for them um, and, and to provide them an opportunity need to essentially, you know, vent out their frustrations because again, um, especially in today's day and age, it's, it's something that's become more and more important. And it's also important for us to, uh, to learn how to wait and be patient. So um, especially in, in psychiatry, I've definitely worked with some colleagues and some doctors where they don't really give a chance for a patient to talk. And I've, I've definitely seen the negative ramifications that can happen, especially patients when they feel like the provider doesn't care for them. So I've learned uh, through my time, again, working as a bedside nurse and then now working as a provider, that's very, very important um, to allow a patient to kind of vocalize and, and um, you know, be patient with them, allow them to answer. Because oftentimes, again, patients, they might be hearing voices, right? But just because that they're silent, it doesn't mean that they have nothing else to say. Maybe they're trying to quiet their brain and they're trying, they're trying to process the questions that you're asking. So it's very important for us to just kind of, you know, take a step back, be patient, allow the patient to process their emotions and, and give them an opportunity to talk. I, I found that to be very, very helpful. I found it to be extremely effective. And um, again, it's, it's, it's one of the things that I've learned with, with experience that uh, patients have really uh, resonated and reciprocated. So um, that's something I feel like is very important quality to have um, and something to remember if you do decide to pursue psychiatry. And um, maintaining composure is also very important. So um, especially in psychiatry, you're gonna be dealing, depending on where you're working, if you do decide to work in the inpatient mental health hospital setting, you are gonna be dealing patients sometimes who are six foot five, you know, really, really big individuals. And, um, you know, maybe the little things can like set them off. And um, it's very, very important for us to not show that you're afraid. Um, it's very important for you to maintain your composure. There's gonna be some patients who's gonna know how to pick your buttons. There are gonna be some patients who will definitely flip a, a switch in regards to their mood and then they can be, they you know, one minute, you're going to be the best thing since sliced bread. And then the next second, if you don't prescribe them the medication that they want from you, or if they, if you don't do whatever it is that they're asking you to do, you know, they can see you as a completely different person. So um, it's very important for us to not take things personally, especially in psychiatry. Um, it's very important for us to understand that oftentimes people who are suffering from mental illness, um, you know, there's a neuropsychological and a neuro and biological component that's happening to them that you know unfortunately it's out of their control and so we have to kind of be understanding in that regard and so it's very very important to again maintain your composure and understand that again you are the provider and you know we're here to pretty much help them as best as we can um, but you know you don't you can't be easily swayed um, especially when patients uh, you know, share everything to you because again, it can be pretty easy to do if you're unable to kind of set limits or set boundaries for yourself and your patients. And then again, it's very, very important again in psychiatry to practice self-care. So especially in this time, advent of COVID-19 and, and the pandemic, self-care, I'm pretty sure many of you guys have seen all throughout the media, as well as all your, um, you know, the, the TV and everything like that, how very crucial and vital it is to practice self-care. So especially working in psychiatry, burnout is a real thing. Um, I know I've definitely had days where I've been mentally, physically, and emotionally spent and exhausted because again, you're, you're pretty much working eight, 10 hour days and you're hearing so many different things from different people. So many people are, are suffering and, and struggling with different things. Um, either they're losing their jobs, loved ones are passing away, they're going through marital discord, relationship issues, um, the list goes on and on and on. So whatever the case may be, whatever it is that makes you feel happier, or whatever it is that'll help you recover and practice that self-care, it's definitely important um, to remember to do, especially if you, you, if you do decide to pursue this career. All right, so um, in conclusion, uh, again, you know, working in psychiatry and working as a psychiatric nurse practitioner is extremely rewarding. And um, if you do 
um, decide to go into nursing. Um, it, it is a profession that, that's continue, continuing to evolve and there's a lot of growth. Um, you know, if you, do, if you don't decide to do psychiatric nurse practitioner, um, you can always do a lot of different things with nursing. And that's something that I didn't even realize that was an option for me when I first chose nursing. But again, I'm very, very thankful that I did choose that field because again, depending on whatever it is that you wanna do, um, the nursing profession can cater to you. And um, as psychiatric nurse practitioners, we do have the unique privilege and opportunity, again, like I said, to take care for patients who are at their most vulnerable. And although the job can be demanding at times, um, you know, again, it's very, very rewarding and it's very important for us to always take care of ourselves and always practice our daily self-care in order for us to prevent any burnout, okay? And so um, before I end, I just wanna leave you with this quote, something that I feel like has definitely resonated with me um, throughout my nursing journey. Um, and it's by Maya Angelou. So I've learned that people will forget what you said, people what will forget what you did, um, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So I hope you guys can definitely take that to heart. And I hope that's something that you guys will, will use um, if you do decide to you know, pursue a healthcare career, all right? Um, that's my references. And um, the QR code, if you guys want, um, you guys can definitely use that. It'll, it's a link to my Instagram page. So if you guys have any questions or you just want to reach out, or if you want to, you know, add, follow me or have a conversation, you know, feel free to do that. Uh, I love meeting you guys. I love being able to kind of share my experiences and share my knowledge and help you guys out in any way I can. And so for all of my followers, new followers after here, I am going to be, um, you know, sending one lucky a follower, a $25 gift card to Starbucks. So um, that if that's something you guys are interested in, you know, feel free to, to follow and I'll definitely connect with you guys there. Um, but with that being said, I'm going to open the floor to some questions. Okay. And I think there's like a lot of questions here already. So I'm going to try my best um, to answer everything or as much as I can. But if not, like I said, if I don't answer your question, just feel free to, um, reach out to me on Instagram and we can definitely um, talk more there, okay? So the first question is, what would you recommend a new graduate uh, RN BSN like me to do in order to get into a psych NP program? So like I said previously, um, if you are a brand new nurse and are interested to becoming a psychiatric nurse practitioner, it's very, very important for you to get some psychiatric uh, bedside care. So if you can find a way to get into the mental health setting or hospital setting, get at least one year of experience uh, working there, I think that'll definitely help you out. Um, just because again, you'll be more familiarized with the medications that are often prescribed. You'll get to know how to work with doctors, how to talk with other providers, and you'll get to see working with that population if that's something that you're really interested in. So definitely get some experience first, okay? Um, let me see what other questions you guys have. There's a lot here. Um, all right, bear with me. There's so many questions. Um, what do you have? What advice do you have for someone like me, a new graduate nurse who aspires to become a psych NP yet is discouraged because people are saying the market will be saturated soon enough? That's a really great question. Um, I'm definitely hearing a lot of that, but I don't want that to discourage you. So um, I don't know if many of you guys are hearing, but of course, especially now in today's day and age, a lot of people now are more interested in pursuing a field in psychiatry um, because of the fact that mental health is becoming more and more important nowadays. However, um, in regards to market saturation, there is still a great need for psychiatric providers whether that's psychiatrists or psychiatric nurse practitioners, um, there's still a definite need for that. Um, and if it's not in California, you know, there's still a lot of need everywhere else throughout the nation. So I don't want you to be discouraged. Um, if this is something that you're passionate about and if this is something that you feel like you're definitely interested in, um, I would still encourage you to still apply and, and you know, go ahead and, and do that because we still need you guys. And um, you know, we can only see so many patients at a time. So we definitely need more, um, competent and empathetic uh, psychiatric providers. Um, what do you enjoy most about being a psych NP? Um, I love the work-life balance. Um, I think that's really, really great. Again, like I guys, you know, like I told you guys, I work four 10 hour days. So it's really, really great to have Friday, Saturday, Sundays off to pretty much spend time with my family or do pretty much whatever else I want to do. Um, it's also really good that, um, again, with, with, the practice setting that I'm working with, um, I pretty much can dictate my schedule. So the great thing about being a provider as opposed to being a bedside nurse is that I can pretty much determine how many patients I wanna see 
and um, kind of go about it that way, which is really, really nice. So you definitely have more autonomy as a provider as opposed to being a registered nurse. So that's, so that's definitely something, um, if it's an incentive for you to pursue higher education, that's definitely one thing because um, having more education um, will definitely provide you more opportunities moving forward. Um, let me see. So what universities or programs would you recommend? So um, there's a lot of really great universities and programs out there. I would definitely um, encourage you to do research. Um, I do want to kind of briefly touch upon um, the, the point of cost. So um, there might be programs out there that are a little bit more or that are a lot less expensive, so to speak. However, they are going to require you to find your own placement for preceptors. So the for the great thing for my program, for example, for Loma Linda University, even though it was a little bit more pricey in regards to tuition, um, since Loma Linda University had their own, has their own health system, um, I didn't have to worry, <clears throat> excuse me, about finding a preceptor on my own. So that was one thing that I had to, you know, worry about. One less thing I had to worry about. So don't just focus all on cost. Definitely really look into the program, really look at the reputation of the university, really look at their pass rates um, in regards to, you know, the percentage of, of their students who actually pass and, and are actually working as a nurse practitioner. Um, it's very, very important to take all that into consideration. And then once you do find uh, a good program, then, you know, I would definitely encourage you to stick to it. But um, in regards to universities, um, I would just have you research that. But if you're asking me, I, I really enjoyed Loma Linda University. Um, they have a really great reputation and I really had a good education there. So, all right. Yeah. And number seven was, did your universities help you locate preceptors? Yeah. Loma Linda helped me locate preceptors. So that was a nice thing about that. All right. Let me see if I can get some at the bottom first. So how does your normal work day go for you? So again, my normal work day goes from 7.30 to about 5.30 in the evening. So it, it varies. So in regards to what I normally do, um, we normally divide patients either as a new evaluation or a follow-up appointment. So for new evaluations, these are patients that I've never seen before. So they give us one hour um, to kind of evaluate, assess, diagnose, as well as conceptualize and pretty much create a treatment plan for that patient, right? So I, depending on how many new evaluations I have throughout that day, you know, I might have one, two, three, or four, um, you know, that's an hour each. And then on top of that, I do have follow-ups that are kind of scattered throughout the day as well. And the follow-up appointments, it can range depending either 30 minutes to 45 minutes. And um, again, follow-up appointments are normally patients that I already know, I already established a rapport on, and it's pretty much just following up on how they're doing. So if I prescribed them a medication at the previous appointment, I wanted to see how they're doing now. Is, is, are they getting better? Are they getting worse? Are they having any adverse side effects on the medication? Um, are they not? You know, do you feel like, are they, I feel like they're improving? So follow-up appointments is, gives me an opportunity to kind of gauge um, how the treatment plan is going and whether or not I need to make any adjustments on that front. Um, and then coupled in between those, um, I do have some administrative work. You know, sometimes patients will ask, you to fill out letters. Um, if, if they're sick and they need a letter for work, you got to fill that out. If they need disability forms because um, they're unable to go to work, you know, it's up to you if you decide to fill that out. And then, you know, we have meetings throughout the day as well. So, but that's pretty much what I normally do on a day-to-day on -day basis. So can you work three days like the traditional RN schedule? Yes, technically you can. Again, it just depends on where you are working. So um, if you do work three days, um, and depending on how many hours you work. So if you do work 10 hour days, 30 hours, um, for some places, some private practices, they consider that full-time still. So technically you can, um, but if you're not considered full full-time, meaning that you won't get the full on benefits as opposed to working the 40 hours. So to answer your question, yes, there is a possibility uh, to work three days or less, but if you work less than three days, um, you'll be considered part-time. But again, that is a that is an option if you do decide to do that. Um, I got one here. It says, I know you mentioned having ER experience. Would you say that helped you as well? I'm currently working in the ICU as a new grad because I wasn't able to find a psych position available. Again, another great question. Yes, the ER experience that I had was extremely invaluable. Um, the ER definitely taught me time management skills. It taught me to think quickly on my feet. It taught me also to not forget or rule out any medical 
um, symptomatology or underlying diagnosis that the patient may have, right? So if a patient is saying that I'm feeling depressed or I'm feeling anxious, I can't just assume that they're feeling just depressed and anxious. Um, um, it's very important to also rule out any other medical conditions you know, um, have labs drawn, uh, check their thyroid levels, you know, because there's a lot of other medical conditions that could be precipitating those symptoms, right? So I feel like having that experience in the ER and ICU really, really helped me um, because it allowed me to also um, lean on my medical knowledge as well, in addition to my, my psychiatric knowledge, uh, to be able to hopefully provide the best care for my patients. What would you say is the best part of being a DNP? Being a DMP is great. Um, I feel like I have so many opportunities um, having my terminal degree. I know that DNP, a lot of people are still kind of confused on what a DNP is, but pretty much DNP is the clinical doctorate. So it's, it's different from a PhD. So um, PhD is more research focused. However, a DNP it involves more translating research into practice. So oftentimes, what they found in bedside is that, you know, even though we have all this amazing research that's out there and all these breakthroughs and everything like that, the things that we're doing at the bedside is, is like maybe five, 10, 20 years old, you know, because maybe because that's how their nurse taught them and that's the nurse and, and so on and so forth. So what the DNP does is actually we, we pretty much look at the newest evidence that's available. And we pretty much translate that into practice at the bedside so that there's synchronicity there, right? Working at the bedside in addition with the newest practice, we want to make sure that intertwines. So that's the great thing about having my DNP, the clinical doctorate, because I'm able to use that, my knowledge and, and helpfully transition um, a lot of the really great research that's out there and, and put it into practice. So, and the DNP is also great because I have a lot of opportunities um, as opposed to having just my master's. So that's also a great plus. Can an MSN psychiatric nurse practitioner open their own private practice? So I don't know if you are aware of this, but um, nurse practitioners in the state of California has just received the okay to do um, you know, independent practice, meaning that I believe starting in 2021, uh, nurse practitioners no longer in California no longer have to be underneath a physician and as a supervisory role in order for you to practice, which is great. So um, one of the things that you're able to do obviously starting next year um, is that you're able, if, if you want, you can start your own practice. However, there is a protocol that you would have to go through. And um, I don't know at the top of my head, but I do um, think that you would have to gain some years of experience first um, in order for you to apply for the ability to um, independently practice. But the fact that California has granted independent practice to nurse practitioners is, is definitely a step forward. Um, a lot of states already are allowing nurse practitioners to function independently. And in regards to uh, patient satisfaction ratings, they are equal, if not sometimes better than their physician counterparts. I love my physicians, I love my physician colleagues, but um, you know, oftentimes people often say like the nurse practitioners, um, they don't provide the same level of care, which is just not true. I've, I've met, I know a lot of really awesome nurse practitioners as well as physician assistants and other providers who are really excellent at what they do. And again, what makes your care stand out differently is is how you are as a person and how you're able to kind of translate your care and as a provider. So just because, you know, one is an MD or one has a DNP or one has a PA, it doesn't mean that they can't be awesome providers, right? It all depends on you and, and how you're able to kind of um, practice based off your style. Um, but yes, in, to answer your question, um, hopefully by next year, um, NPs uh, can definitely open their own practices, which is great. Um, all right, this one has from Natalie. She has like <laughs> seven questions. Oh, those are the uh, same ones that I sent you in oh, the beginning. So yeah. awesome. I think I think then do I have anything else? Okay. Um, what are other factors do graduate NP schools look for besides grades and GPA? Like, are there extracurricular experiences or volunteer work that we should keep in mind when applying? So to answer your question, again, this might differ now because again, when I applied, it was 2015. So in regards to maybe what they're looking for, it might vary. But in my experience, uh, experience as on the best side is definitely important. Um, but to definitely stand, to make you guys, to make you stand out, um, it's, it, I would definitely encourage you to um, participate and to volunteer in, in different things, whatever it is that makes, you know, that you're passionate in. So if you can get involved in, in 
clubs or nonprofit organizations. Um, if you do tra um, travel nursing or whatever the case, obviously you can't travel as much right now because of the pandemic, but um, you know, try to, try to find ways to really set yourself apart. Um, for me, um, I always try to encourage people to write. Like if, if you are able to write or publish articles, I mean, that's, that's so definitely something that you can, keep you apart um, because uh, as, as nurses people don't, nurses don't realize that you have the power to publish articles and and share your knowledge with the rest of the healthcare profession so um, definitely try incorporating that um, if you do like you know public speaking as well and, and sharing your knowledge I would definitely encourage you to do that as well um, but it, it wouldn't hurt to definitely have some volunteer work um, underneath your belt to definitely keep your resume and your CV um, unique and hopefully it'll give you a better shot to be interviewed. So that's a good question. Um, Miriam says, I don't know if you went over this already. I came a bit late. Do you specialize in any specific mental illnesses? So I, I'm a, I pretty much primarily treat adult um, populations. So it's from 18 to 65. Um, what I normally specialize um, is depression, anxiety, um, ADHD, mood disorders, um, just because of the fact that that's the the most of the the diagnosis that I that I deal with on a on a weekly basis, um, but yeah, those are pretty much I guess uh, what I specifically deal with. But um, yeah, I guess it just it just depends on what you are interested in. But but that's pretty much what I do. Um, and do I got a question from Raphael? Do psych nurse practitioners earn more than a clinical psychologist. Um, I'm not quite sure how much a clinical psychologist makes. Again, I think it would vary depending on number one, years of experience, um, as well as where they're working. Um, but just to put it in perspective, I do know that a lot of my psych NP colleagues, they make pretty decent money to say the least again depending on where they work especially here in california um they can make well over six figures um so it's 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 definitely um something in regards to job stability on the financial standpoint um you know it, it is something that you are able to uh, support yourself and your family if you do decide to do that but in regards to knowing if they make more i'm, I'm just not sure unfortunately just because i don't know how much a clinical psychologist normally makes but that's that. <laughs> um, let me see if I have any more questions. If you guys have any more questions, feel free to to drop it in here. I know we're kind of running a little bit on time, short on time, but I just want to make sure I can get as much questions. Um, all right. All right. What are fact? All right. All right. Have you thought taking a master's would have aided in your journey? Um, not really. Um, I feel like the program that I was in, um, it was it was created in a way where, again, it was able to have someone who has a bachelor's degree and transition them, them over to their terminal degree. So I, I didn't think, you know, having my master's before I pursued my, my doctorate uh, would have made a difference, to be honest. Um, let me see. What reasons would someone prefer the nursing route over the doctorate route? So that's a very good question. And ultimately, it would just depend on you and what your preferences are. So again, depending on, you know, there's a lot of different factors that you would have to kind of weigh out. Number one, first and foremost, is understanding the different um, modalities in regards to the models that you're looking at, right? The medical model is a little bit different. Um, they really focus on the disease process and really trying to uh, have a very, very um, meticulous understanding on what's really going on in regards to the underlying disease processes and stuff like that. Um, nursing, um, even though we do um, are trained in that, um, that's not what we're only trained in. We are trained more in a holistic approach. So trying to take into consideration the, the emotional, psychosocial, physical, mental aspects of the patient. And again, since nursing, we practice more on bedside care. Um, it really separates how we provide as providers as opposed to um, the medicine model, just because for, for medical students, they don't normally get um, training 
and you know with the best I care until they start clinicals um, and then they don't really continue that until they get into residency but for us as nurses we, we pretty much have that um, as in clinicals and then when we do work as a bedside nurse I mean we we obviously get more experience on that front um, but again it just depends on on what you feel like would benefit you. Again, for, for, med for medicine, you have four years of undergraduate for medicine, then four years of medical school. And then you, depending on the residency that you do, you, it would be another three to four years. And on top of that, if you do fellowship, it'll be another, again, three or four years, depending on if you guys to pursue that. And uh, in, in regards to nursing, obviously you have your four years undergraduate nursing. And then if you do decide to pursue your master's, that'll be another two to three years. Or if you decide to get your doctorate, it's another four years on top of that. The great thing about nursing is that, you know, we, you know, we don't have a residency, so to speak, since our residency is pretty much our experience working as a nurse. So we, you know, the minute I graduated from my DNP, I earned six figures right away. You know, as opposed to residents who are straight out of medical school, I know they get maybe I think on average forty to fifty thousand. Again, depending on um, where they're practicing, but it take they have to get through the whole um, residency program first before they can start making those six figures marks after graduate residency. So again, it just depends um, on you. But I wouldn't use money as a sole factor or the time as a sole factor. Make sure you do it because of the fact that you're passionate about uh, whatever field that it is, whether you choose this pursue the medicine route versus the nursing route. So that's what I would recommend for you guys. All right. Um, but these are all great questions. So um, if you guys have anything else, you know, feel free to put, put it down here. I just want to make sure there's, I'm not missing anyone or anything. Yeah. Um, so for Eaton said, why did you choose nursing over becoming a medical doctor? Um, that's a great question. I don't know. It's one of those things where I feel like fate kind of played a role into that. I feel like this is where God wanted me to be, to be honest. Um, you know, my, I have a younger brother who's attending UC Riverside. Um, he's in medical school. My girlfriend is also in medical school. Um, and, and I've had colleagues who are physicians and they definitely told me you can definitely go into medicine. But again, um, everyone's path is different. Everyone's journey is different. Um, I felt like nursing was one of those things where I guess that's where I was really meant to be. And I don't regret it whatsoever because of the fact that um, I, I really do enjoy the nursing model. I love our approach. I love the fact that I really got a chance to really understand the importance of taking care of a patient, knowing how it is to have that experience experience in that relationship with that patient and, and not just fully focused on just the disease process because I want to treat the person as the person themselves and I don't want to look at them as just like this person has hypertension this person has you know diabetes and I, I don't want to look at them as a diagnosis and so nursing really stressed the importance of looking at the person as a person and to take all that into consideration and then to allow that to kind of guide how you you know, conceptualize and you create a treatment plan for a patient. So that's, that's why I really love nursing. And um, because of the fact they've given me that extra, um, that extra component that I feel like I may have not have gotten as quickly um, if I chose the medicine route. Um, does it matter if you go to a top medical school or not? Um, so yes and no, it would all depend again. So um especially in today's day and age, networking is the most important thing that you can do. Um, I would say it's in more important than the type of the name of the school that you attend, right? So um, if you guys haven't done so already, definitely um, take some time and make sure that your LinkedIn looks good, um, especially use this time now to network with your professors, network with your colleagues. Um, it's all pretty much about who you know, because it's, it's, the, it's those type of relationships that, that will provide those opportunities for you moving forward. Um, but to kind of, kind of answer your question, um, as long as the school is accredited and as long as you have, you know, your licensure to practice, a lot of times, you know, uh, employers, they don't really care about what school you've attended. Um, so it's one of those things to just to keep in mind. But um, again, networking is very, very key um, in order for you to, to get far in life. All right, I think we got three more minutes here. So trying to see if I can have any more. Again, these are great questions, guys. Thank you guys so much. Um, let me see if I can get more. Um, all right. 
I don't see. I think for the most part, we're good. Let me see. All right, Natalie, I think we're good. I don't see any more questions. So I think I'm going to end it here. But feel free if you guys have any other questions to, you know, follow me on Instagram, um, you know, message me. And I'll, I'll definitely, you know, be more than happy to share a little bit more, you know, to answer any of your questions or share a little bit more of my knowledge um, if you guys are interested, okay? But thank you guys so much for coming today. It was a pleasure to be able to share my, um, my experience with you. And, and hopefully you found it to be insightful and helpful for you guys. And, and I look forward to potentially serving and working with you guys um, in the future. All right. So thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yamas. And um, I sent the Google form in the chat. I can send it one more time. Okay. Sounds good. I and think you guys are awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. That was a really great talk. I really enjoyed it, like learning more about the nurse practitioner field. Of course. Which I don't have a lot of knowledge about. Of course. Thank you. And in regards to the certificates, I just wanted to let you guys know that um, sometimes it can take us more than one or two days to send them out. And usually we will have them sent out by um, before the next session. So if... Um, we don't have it out by then. If you don't receive one from us, then you can go ahead and contact, um, email me. My email is the email that got sent out like with the Zoom link. And then you can contact me if you have any other questions. And also, I don't know, um, Dr. Yams, if you wanna share that QR code again so that people can quickly get to your Instagram. Um, all right, let me see, let me share screen again. Oh, hold on. I don't know why it went away. I apologize. Let me see. Let me see. It's been working. I'll go back. There we go. Let me see. Okay, hold on. Or if that doesn't work, um, if you want to, like, you can type your, oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, but thank you guys all for coming. And um, I, I took a picture. I want to make sure that I want to see, like, have a picture with everyone. I don't know if everyone will be left or whatever, but it'd be nice to. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, if you guys are still here and would like to turn your cameras on, we can take a picture. I can't do it from my phone but um if i don't know how to do this yeah um do you want to take do you want to just take the picture on your computer would that be possible yeah let me see i'm trying to because <laughs> the thing is i want to make sure that i get everyone i can try to see but there we go i want to make sure okay all right I think people are, some people are still turning on their cameras. So there we go. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to go ahead. Oh, all right. I'm going to count three and I'm just going to like do a couple of screenshots here. Okay, guys. But thank you guys again so much for coming. It was really a pleasure to be able to talk to you guys and um, yeah, I'm excited to hopefully see some of you in the nursing profession real soon. Okay. All right. On the count of three, um, smile one, two, three. All right. And then one more, one, two, three. Awesome. And I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. No, oh, thank you guys all for coming. Ready. Right. Have a good rest of your day. I'm gonna go ahead and end the meeting now, but yeah, thank you guys all for coming. And yeah, we hope to see you guys next week.